at Glide, you do church, but you do something that isn't church. So, you, so could you talk a little bit about what is church at Glide? Or is, it, is Glide the non-church? I would say that Glide is what the, is, is the experience that you create within that community. And I would say that that is spiritual. You know, you might want to call it church. I think of church as institutional, but I think the real church, and I'll say church very, in the, in the vast sense of the word, truly is that which liberates. And it liberates the individual to be, to come with their full selves, to be present with community. And if you experience God, spirit, spirituality, Buddha, Allah, Jehovah, I mean, whom, whatever, whatever entity you choose to worship, right. that that is, that is part of the creative process. You know, and I think that that's what makes Glide celebrations such a creative event because it's people experiencing for themselves, again, whatever opening they've discovered that is their avenue or their dialogue with their God, with God, or with spirit. That, it seems that almost every program has a self-expression part of, of it at Glide. Am because I? it's based upon the needs of the people. And because the programs there, all of the programs there, have been created out of the needs of the people with the people. So you can't create a program because you've gotten $100,000 from the government and so, okay, it, it has this program and this and this and this part of the curriculum or part of the program and this part of the service. No, we built all of our programs, most of our programs are without the money. The money came later. But we, we built the programs based on their needs. So if you're feeding hungry people, okay, we're feeding hungry people. And we started with 50. And it grew now to 900,000 meals a year. Um, we, we saw that the people coming through the doors for food were hungry for many other things. They were hungry for community, they were hungry for recovery, they were hungry for you know, their womanhood or their manhood or their childhood, they were hungry for a home, they were hungry for acceptance, they were hungry for justice, they were hungry for hope. They were hungry for so many things. I mean, you don't just fulfill somebody's bodily needs. I mean, so we created a crisis center because poverty is never a, a, a one-dimensional issue. It's not just about hunger. It's not just about housing. It's not just about mental illness. So the community is defining its own needs. You're not, you're not sitting there and saying, we're going to create a crisis center. You're actually experiencing the community. The community saying, created the crisis center. They said, we're in crisis, we need a crisis, crisis center. center. Yes, we need toothbrushes, we need hygiene kits, we need you know, uh, three nights at a shelter, we need someone to counsel us, we need some advocacy at, at some city right. agency. We need, okay, and that's how the crisis center was built, now into a walk-in center that provides thousands of people with things that they need. And the food program we see as a real gateway to recovery, to the health clinic. We have so much triaging that goes on there in our recovery circles for women. We have a battered women's center that is magnificent. Um, and we triage them. We've had 10 women go up for mammograms. And we have partnerships that are pretty incredible. And again, very creative and very invented, invent, inventive, Invent. because um, we have partnerships with Catholic Healthcare West. We're pro-choice, go figure. And we, with three different hospitals, and so with CPMC, uh, for example, they're giving free mammogram tests, and if they discover cancer, breast cancer in a woman, they will give her free treatment. Now that is real hope. You know what I'm saying? Yes. That's really, really fulfilling a need. And the outreach is specifically to the poorest to the women who cannot afford, who do not know what it means to get a mammogram, who don't understand what it means to have a breast test, who don't know how to take care of themselves because nobody has ever cared for them. So that is where I think hope is created. And I will tell you that personally I've had to invent myself over and over again because there is so much creativity that is there, that is on those streets that come through the doors of Glide. And I feel very blessed to 
every day have to address my necessity to change. So it's a dialogue. It, it, it's so interesting that there's a dialogue that's going in where the community defines its own need. It expresses its own, its own uh, demand for attention. And there is a response that then comes. And through that dialogue, a service evolved, defined by the community, provided by the community. Yes. Glide acting as a church for expression, for opening up, for uh, basically providing the, the, the place where that, where that dialogue can happen, and then shaping a service out of that dialogue. It's, it, it's a lot different than an investment approach where somebody comes in and provides a restricted gift and says, you will do this and you will create these reports. How do you feel about that type of a, that type of a philanthropic approach that, that has now gained so much currency where people think of philanthropy almost as a return on investment, as if it's a corporate defined, I'm the donor, I will therefore define what I'm investing in? I think that those are fine for certain institutions. I think it doesn't work as well for us because again, um, if you create programs from top down instead of bottom up, right. you get a different kind of program. You're gonna have people who have, the, have a need for those services, but I think it's a difference between, and I'll just be crass about it, but it's a difference between paternalism and leveling the ground. It's the difference between a vertical paradigm and a horizontal one. And I think at Glide, what, what we attempt to do is to make sure that people are perceived as your equal, that they are perceived as you know, having voice and deserving dignity and deserving their rights to health care and to housing and to, you know, and to, and to have, having the quality of life that all human beings do deserve. So it's, I mean, an, empower, I think, it's an empowerment. Well, and they, but they have to make that decision. And you know, if it's a mutual act, if it's a dialogue. Engaged. Absolutely. Otherwise, what? You have another welfare recipient. So it's not you have another dependent. You have another welfare system. You have another addiction, <laughs> which is an addiction to handouts, an addiction to, to welfare, an addiction to poverty. Why not sit at home and just get a handout if that's what you can do? So everybody becomes a decider in their own lives. They you, decide. They have to decide for yourself. You cannot. You cannot. It's like recovery. If you're an addict, if you're an alcoholic, any addict, any alcoholic, any spending addict, any addict, I don't care what the addiction is, right. will tell you that no one can cure you. No one can fix you. No one can tell you what to do. No one can decide for you. You have to decide for yourself that I'm going to change my life. I'm going to change my life because I'm sick and tired of being dependent. Is that why so many of your programs start off with speaking out? Yes, of, of, of absolutely. Saying Starts out with liberation. And I mean, I'm not, I'm stealing that line from Cecil because he's a liberation theologian and I had to figure out what that meant because I had to struggle for my own liberation. I was the most penned up person in the world. You know, I really was so defined by others and what others thought of me. I so much believed I was not acceptable. Were I you, so much was entrapped by my shame. Image? Absolutely. I mean, when you are entrapped by shame, which I was, and I still continue to struggle with it, then you, of course you always need affirmation from the outside. You struggle with shame? Of course I do. Anybody, I mean, I won't say that. I, who had to deal with abuse, you know, have felt enormous shame about that. And there's more shame that comes from feeling that somehow as a child I either asked for it, I deserved it, or I was in collusion with it. Those are the most painful and humiliating feelings that one can have about that. And that's where the shame is so difficult to, you know, to really excavate and release because the wounds are very deep. Um, I would say that shame is what a lot of our silence is about. And that's why it's a prison. Because one can't begin to release that shame until you can tell somebody and they can say, oh wow, I did that too. Or, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Or, geez, yeah, I do play solitaire at night on my computer also. I mean, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, it, once you're outed and once, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. once you can't hide, you know, or once you don't hide, or once you decide not to hide, 
um, I think you are, free, you, you are releasing something. You're liberating yourself from that which has enslaved you. What is it like dealing with both sides of the equation, the abused, but also the abuser? I will say that on a Sunday, we had a young man who got up on stage. We didn't know who he was, although we had met through other organizations. And he got up and he read a poem about being a batterer. And at one point, as he was describing, looking at his woman friend, and she, who he had just injured, spoke to him with her tears. And that got to his tears. And he looked inside of himself with so much shame and so much pain about himself that he broke down on stage. And you could see that everyone broke down with him. I broke down with him. And I would say that, that if you don't deal with that part of it, if you just deal with the, the victim, that you're not looking at the whole picture. The abuser needs as much recovery as the person who is battered and if not more so. And that's why I think it takes more than just a job training program, it takes more than just a meals program. There are a myriad of, it's, it is the village that is required to create a community that is powerful, that feels powerful, that is vocal, that can create its own invention that can be creative and inventive all the time, that can build community, that can spread community, that can, you know, exponentially uh, multiply community, and that can um, uh, interpret and, and live out the values that we talk about. I mean, values are just words unless we live them and experience them. So words like justice and dignity and, and, and compassion and unconditional love and acceptance and justice are, and with justice with love are just words unless we live them and unless we enact them and unless we practice them mutually with one another. I mean, otherwise they're just empty principles, they're just platitude. What I find to be interesting, when you, when you talk about recovery and America needing recovery, you're talking about the rich and the poor. It's such an interesting model of, of non-judgment, uh, but, but active engagement. It's, it, it becomes a, in a sense, it becomes a performance art of transformation, of, of acting out until you become. I would say that that is right, if we're not looking at service in a paternalistic manner. Yes. So it's not from top to bottom. It really is from equal ground. Yes. And that people perceive each other as human beings. And that creative act of creating a relationship, which is what I think is so essential to building community, is in that relationship. It's all about the relationship. It's all about how you perceive the human being that you're standing across that table from. And you know that. What, it's thanking it, what each other. It's thanking each it's, other. It's for being it. and it's feeling, you know, the kind of humanity that is possible. That comes from that diversity. And again, I feel, I think Cecil and I feel very strongly about diversity, which is such a hard, such a difficult um, element to achieve. But isn't that our original motto as a as a nation? As in, a nation, in yes. In unity, e pluribus unum. In unity, diversity. In diversity, unity. I think diversity has again been um, become a platitude and become an easy word to throw around. But to truly practice diversity, you have to truly have level ground, and you truly have to be able to give up your assumptions about who you are and who the other is. You truly have to open yourself up for yourself to change first, and then you may see the other person as they really are. I think that that is a key to diversity. And if you are not comfortable with that, you will invariably not strive for diversity. You invariably will have a room of everybody who looks like you, rather than people who look like people you don't really know very well. Yes. And it's not comfortable. It's not comfortable. I mean, when the young man got up to speak, you know, very t large Samoan young man, 
a Pacific Islander young man. I mean, I could see everybody's eyes flickering, all these different assumptions. And I, I mean, I had, to, I had to like go, I'm leaping over the, any assumptions <laughs> and I'm gonna grab this guy and hug him. And he was the sweetest, the most gentle, the most open person. And he opened the door for me, again, to recreate, reinvent myself. I had to change. So, and, I mean, it, it, that's what I think is creative. And you had to change from the point of view of somebody who has themselves experienced abuse. Yes, of course. And really, really stand in true acceptance of this person. True acceptance. You know, you're not standing there with the judgment. You're not standing there with, oh, okay, I wonder what's going to happen next. You're not standing there with all of those qualifications. You, you stand there, and you know that you're equal with this person, and you know that you can withstand whatever, whatever that engagement brings. So, and I haven't always been like that. And it's really been very difficult for me to create my ground and to be able, and I want to say this to women, especially to women is that we ourselves have to take responsibility for our power. We cannot ask you to grant, you males in society, to grant us power. You we get back must, to paternalism. Or, and again, it's us asking, you know, right. can, will you please accept us? Forget that. I mean, we really, <laughs> really do have to come to the table and say, yes, I am present. I am powerful. I have something to contribute. And I'm not, you know, talking about those, those awful stereotypes about strong women, et cetera. Right. You know, because we've, got to, we've really got to get, let those go, too. Um, the stronger we can be together, I think the greater society we can build. Um, and, and that's what we've discovered with the people who come out of recovery. They're some of the strongest, the most courageous people I know. And I, I f find that a lot of my mentors are the women particularly who have come out of battered women's shelters or have come out of shelters and who have come out of their addictions and who have you know, gotten back their children, been reunited with their children that have been taken from them because of their drug abuse or whatever, and rebuilt their lives and, and have jobs or are now giving back to the community and paying it forward, paying the love forward. I think that that's what we owe to those who have helped us survive and those who have helped us, helped us thrive. Now, there's a lot of there's a lot of positiveness about about Glide. When when I've attended uh, your events, when I've attended your celebrations, when I've witnessed some of the services, there's an awful lot of joy. There's a lot of joking. There's a lot of work, uh, but there's a lot of singing. Uh, there's dance. There's there's art. There's there's um, your booming laughter down the hall. It's, it's, is it booming? Oh, it's booming. It's, oh, dear. It's, it's, okay. It's joyous. It's not it's, delicate and, and it's gorgeous. demure. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> no, demure would not be would not a descriptive <laughs> to come, that came to mind. But there is some criticism embedded in that. There are people who think that, that all resource, all energy should go into the, the logistics of service. Um, what, do, what do you say to that? To that type of uh, a critique? Well, I would say probably so. You know, I could probably wear sackcloth. <laughs> um, but I would say that without the joy and without the hope, then it really is a very non nutritious meal to me. Um, and you know, we can talk about how we're cost effective. We can talk about the dollars and cents. We can talk about our own deprivation because we're not one of these slick looking places. We really do need some remodeling <laughs> very badly. <laughs> we need a new boiler. <laughs> we need a generator. I mean, there are, we could talk about that, but I don't want to go there. I just want to say that for those who uh, eschew joy, for those who feel that service really means, you know, being solemn, and um, service means penance. Servants means. Then I say go to it. Means, yes. Go to it over there, but, but what wherever really I dwell, <laughs> if I can't laugh, then I'm not going to dwell there long. And I don't know that too many people who would enjoy dwelling there either. Um, I believe we have a joyful village, and we're not joyful all the time. 
I mean, we take enormous, we, we cry, we take enormous amounts of time to grieve and to, and to mourn and to wail our pain. But we also take those moments of great joy about being free in that moment. And if you don't do that, then your heart will shrivel. And I have to say that to everybody, your heart will shrivel. Nourishment is not just about calories. No, nourishment is not about just the calories and the solemn, solemnity of Sorry. your handout, okay? I don't want your handout, I want your love. I want, I mean, I want to feel like you care about me. I want to feel like I exist for you. Do you see me when you put that plate of food before me? Do you hear me? Can you hear my cry? I mean, do you understand that, you know, I may have lost my child, I may have lost my father, I may have lost my mother, I may have been thrown out by my family, I'm mentally ill, I may be hearing all kinds of voices in my head, but I'm just as important to you as the next person. So that to me is nourishment. That to me is nourishment. And I have to say this about the celebrations. I think when Cecil changed service to celebration, that was brilliant, because it really is about celebrating life. And when you talk about art, you can't separate it from the music that gives us hope, the incredible choir that makes everybody transcended. I mean, that just lifts everybody up. And you can't separate it from the dancing and the movement and the clapping and, you know, the en enormous sense of community that is there where you, for that hour and a half maybe, become less important than, you know, the checkbook that you're going to write or, you know, the, the, the bank deposit that you're going to make. You become, you become one with other people. And I don't know that what, what's more fulfilling and nourishing than that. But, um, yeah, I mean, I like my shoes. But I, you know, it's not, it doesn't, it's not what defines me. Yes. And if indeed the solemnity of service is what defines service, then I don't want service. I would rather have liberation. You'd rather have a celebration. I would rather have celebration. I would rather be able to provide people's needs with them, struggle and march with them to find out how we can solve our problems together, rather than, you know, for me to think, I've got the answer to that. We don't. Janice Mirakatani, thank you so much for spending time. Thank you.